Hello everyone, so we are now entering the fourth chapter of this year's Agribusiness Forum. This chapter will focus on the financial instruments and risk management. As an introductory remark prior to giving the floor to the first speaker, I would like to say that at first I was considering to open this chapter with an ancient quote. But these morning's chapters have already laid the foundations to be more concrete and specific in that case. Because I attended the first chapter, Fox and Environment and Energy, and they laid special emphasis on the fact that if there's no financing, if there's no proper risk management, the huge investments that are required in order to ensure the shift towards the energy transition are not feasible. But also when it comes to the supply chain and logistics, the concept of financing had been crucial. Now, I will try to follow the agenda and I will opt for the lady first. So I would like to give the floor to Ms. Tatiana Yemelu. She is the head of the business development sector at the National Bank of Greece. Our paths have crossed in the path. You know her, she's quite popular, so she's going to make a presentation in order to talk on behalf of the traditional banking system. Ms. Yemelu, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure that I find myself here today. It is the third consecutive presence of mine in this conference with great pleasure that the National Bank of Greece supports this effort because the National Bank of Greece is one of the banks that stands by the side of Greek farmers, Greek livestock breeders in order to finance sustainable units and standalone producers and farmers. Today, we are here to implement an extensive action plan aiming at the financial support of producers and businesses operating in the broader agri-food sector. We have developed a series of specialized products and services specially designed for the Greek farmers, for example, provision of credits, contract farming, which is our favorite, the farmer's card, and we also participate in various programs that are provided in collaboration with other financial institutions. We are here to provide an overview of financial instruments and the ways in which we support Greek farmers. A well-known pro program has to do with contract farming. It upgrades and modernizes the entire comprehensive system of agri-food products and services. The National Bank of Greece covers a part of the financing needs of the producers, the products of which, of whom rather, are going to be bought by cooperatives of other specific market sectors. And those things are highly beneficial for the producers because it provides them with the right liquidity, they have beneficial financing terms, they reduce their production costs and the producer is able to use the available funds in order for the boost and improve their productivity and infrastructure. And the payment disbursement happens automatically as soon as the products are being bought. On the basis of the new law, farmers that sell their products in the context of contract farming, I'm talking about 5% of their product, have are entitled to a 5% discount on their taxes. I would like to give you an example of contract farming that is rather widespread runs at Komotini. For the past decades, we have tens of Muslims for producers and farmers, and until recently, they were growing tobacco. Given that now electronic cigarettes require one-fifth of the traditional tobacco requirements, Philip Morris International, in collaboration with Stevia, provide financial support and know-how to producers and tobacco growers so that they can switch their production and focus on the production of Stevia plants. Our bank supports this transition by including those farmers in the contract farming project so that this transition runs in a more smooth way. This is an endeavor that apart from the apparent financial benefits will also contribute to the empowerment of relations between the bank and a very sensitive part of the Greek population. 
Another well-known process, I believe that most of you know that better than ourselves, is the farmer's card. You can see here the detailed features of this card. You all know that it is a valuable tool offered by the National Bank of Greece in collaboration with the Ministry of Development. And the conclusion drawn is that this year as well has been we have seen, rather, an increased interest on behalf of Greek farmers. The fact that they receive in advance 80 percent approximately of the total aid amount, the extremely low interest rates and the possibility of immediate liquidity is something that has attracted the interest of farmers. This year, given the high cost of production, the National Bank of Greece has stood by the side of our farmers, enabling them to take this card before they submit the declarations, so the financial declaration for their previous year on the basis of their tax returns of the previous year. Of course, uh, we have more financing tools uh, in our toolkit. Uh, some of them cannot fit in the slide, but they're all available on our website. And of course, uh, feel free to visit a branch to find out more. Our experienced staff can help you choose the right tool to meet your needs. But what is important and needs to be highlighted is that for the first time, our actions portfolio for the support of the agriculture sector, we have included a set of solutions and products that offer provisional guarantees by financial institutions, reduced interest rate, and of course, expedited process, expedited processing of the application. This means that we can now address the long-term issues and hardships faced, faced by the Greek farmers. Of course, this requires for the interested party to know what they're asking for, know what they're looking for, have a specific business plan as well as a specific estimate of the profit that this investment will yield. Other actions, because this is not enough. Here you can see the new actions that have already been announced or we are expecting them to be announced. We have the modernization of the primary sector by the Resilience and Recovery Fund. We have the combination of various actions in with financing tools that I present in the previous slide mean that now farmers can benefit from a comprehensive solutions package in case they want to modernize their infrastructure, equipment, premises, if they want to extend their activity, if they want to package their product or change and boost their investment plans. National Bank of Greece has seasoned professionals who stand by the side of our farmers in order to help them throughout the way. And now that's my last slide that was recently added. That's our new baby. It's embedded banking, a new option that I'd like to introduce to you. This is something that had been a vision for many years, but now it's high time we collected them all and presented them all. What we're trying actually to do is to reach out to the client. Apart from businesses, farmers, we might also address that to consumers. What we want is to be able to offer a comprehensive set of banking services on site, at the pre where they're going to buy their equipment, where they're going to buy the supplies for their land, where they're going to make an investment in order to buy a piece of machinery that will boost their production. So we offer banking services, financing cards, insurance programs, to the benefit of whom all the clients, all our customers, horizontal other farmers, and we need to find the right channel to reach out for them. Their villages, at a store, in a commercial business, where they are going to buy a new tractor, or where they're going to ask for a quote or for financing, or when they all seek consulting or advice. Embedded banking can meet the needs of all farmers. We are there for them, we are there for farmers, our customers, for all businesses. So, there's nothing else left. Just give us a call. We will come to you to cover all your needs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Yemelu. Well, I, it would be nice to say that this uh, customer-oriented customer approach uh, would be nice. And we will have uh, some questions later on on how the crisis, of course, affects this approach, but also uh, the interest rates and their uh, position. Let's see what the question will be from the Internet. 
Τώρα θα ήθελα να καλέσω τον κύριο Σλίθ Χόης. Ελπίζω να μην κατέστρεψα την προφορά του ονόματός σας. Θα μας μιλήσει ως υπεύθυνος, ως διευθυντής της Μονάδας για τις Πολιτικές Προοπτικών της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής του DG Agri. Θα μας παρουσιάσει στην, με τη σειρά του διάφορα άλλα ζητήματα που έχουν να κάνουν με το μέλλον, ερωτήσεις στον χώρο της, του, των αγροτικών. Θα μας μιλήσει σχετικά με τα υψηλά επιτόκια που όλοι βλέπουμε να εξελίσσονται. Έχετε γύρω στα 15 λεπτά, έχετε το λόγο. Θα προσπαθήσω να ενσωματώσω την ερώτησή σας. Σας ευχαριστώ για την πρόσκληση. Πραγματικά, οι θερμοκρασίες εδώ είναι πιο θερμές από ό,τι στο γραφείο μας. Δεν ξέρω αν φαίνεται η παρουσίασή μου. Μπορώ να την αλλάξω. Οι θερμοκρασίες φυσικά είναι αυτές που μας συνδέουν με την ιδέα που έχουμε για τις αγορές των αγροτικών. Να δούμε ποια είναι η κατάστασή τους, να δούμε τα μακροχρόνια δεδομένα και τις αλλαγές. Βλέπουμε τις υψηλές τιμές ενέργειας που επηρεάζουν φυσικά τις τιμές ενέργειας, τον τομέα μας και φυσικά θα πρέπει να δούμε πώς επηρεάζουν τις ΜΕΝ και τις ΔΕ φάρμες. Σίγουρα όμως υπάρχουν χώρες που δυσκολεύονται με αυτή την κρίση. Κάτι άλλο που δεν θα πρέπει να ξεχάσουμε είναι ο πληθωρισμός στα τρόφιμα και σε πολλές ευρωπαϊκές χώρες τα τρόφιμα ε, έχουν ακριβήνει. Βλέπουμε αυξήσεις ε, γύρω στο 15% ε, σε κάποιες χώρες έχουν φτάσει και το 30% στην Ελλάδα βρισκόμαστε στο περίπου 10%. Πέρα από το σοκ της εισβολής στην Ρωσία στην Ουκρανία, υπάρχουν και υπάρχει και μια άλλη υποθάλψα κρίση, αυτή που συζητάτε στην Αίγυπτο, στην COP27, αναφέρθηκε και νωρίτερα, και είναι σημαντικό να δούμε τι γίνεται σε αυτή την συγκεκριμένη περιοχή. Βλέπουμε τις μηδενικές εκπομπές που θέλουμε να φτάσουμε έως το 2050. Πρέπει να κάνουμε πολλά και ο αγροδιτροφικός τομέας επίσης. Αν δεν γίνει αυτό, σίγουρα αν δεν γίνει αυτό, θα επηρεαστούν οι δυνατότητες μας στην παραγωγή και θα δείτε και τον αντίκτυπο της κλιματικής αλλαγής. Παραδείγματος χάρη, μειώθηκε κατά 8% η παραγωγή δημητριακών στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και 24% μειώθηκε ο αραβόστος. Βλέπουμε λοιπόν τι μπορεί να γίνει σε διάφορα σημεία της Γης, ποιες θα είναι οι επιπτώσεις κλιματικής λαγής. Δεν μπορούμε να τα δούμε όταν γίνονται, αλλά μπορούμε να τα δούμε μετά. Όλοι, όλος αυτός ο νευρασμός στην αγορά και όλες αυτές οι προκλήσεις, οι περιβαλλοντικές, πρέπει να συνοδευτούν και με απαντήσεις βραχυπρόθεσμα για να δούμε τρεις απαντήσεις που έχει μπορέσει να δώσει η Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή. Το Μάρτιο του 2022 είχαμε την ενημέρωση σχετικά με την διαφύλαξη της επιστημικής ασφάλειας και την ενίσχυση της ασφάλειας και της ανθεκτικότητας των διατροφικών συστημάτων. Υπάρχει αρκετό φαγητό στην Ευρώπη, όμως μιλάμε για παγκόσμια επιστημική ασφάλεια Εκεί έχουμε χτίσει τις διάφορες πράσινες γραμμές αλληλεγγύης 
και αυτές θα μας βοηθήσουν συνεχώς να παράγουμε τρόφιμα για να μπορέσουμε να είμαστε σίγουροι ότι θα έχουμε διαθέσιμα τρόφιμα και να εξάγουμε τρόφιμα από την Ευρώπη, στη Μέση Ανατολή, στην Αφρική και αλλού. Επίσης, Προσπαθούμε να στηρίξουμε και τους Ευρωπαίους αγρότες μέσω διαφόρων μέτρων. 492 εκατομμύρια ευρώ άμεσης βοήθειας, αλλά και άλλα μέτρα, παραδείγματος χάρη κρατική βοήθεια, και όπως ανέφερα και την χαλάρωση φυσικά της παραγωγής. Έχουμε κάνει διάφορες δράσεις, παγκόσμια στήριξη της παραγωγής και προσπαθούμε να εξεχωνίσουμε και τα συστήματα, τα αγροδιατροπικά. Τον η πράσινη συμφωνία και η στρατηγική από Farm to Fork από το αγρόκτημα στο πιάτο είναι αυτή που θα μεταμορφώσει το ευρωπαϊκό διαδροφικό σύστημα μεταξύ άλλων. Επίσης, τα εθνικά στρατηγικά πλαίσια είναι το σημείο κλειδί για τα επόμενα χρόνια. Θα πρέπει να δούμε τι θα γίνει και με τα λοιπάσματα. Είναι τελείως διαφορετικά εδώ τα προβλήματα με την ενεργειακή κρίση. Και βλέπουμε και μια, ένα άλλο πρόβλημα. Θα πρέπει να είμαστε σίγουροι ότι έχουμε επαρκή λοιπάσματα που παράγονται με βιώσιμο τρόπο. Παραδείγματος χάρη, η πράσινη αμμονία που αναφέρθηκε σήμερα. Χάρηκα που το άκουσα γιατί πράγματι είναι μια κατεύθυνση που θέλουμε να έχουμε προς το μέλλον. Όλες αυτές οι ανακοινώσεις αφορούν βραχυπρόθεσμα μέτρα. Μπορεί να μην είναι αρκετά, μπορεί να χρειάζομαστε παραπάνω. Αυτά είναι όμως τα μέσα διαθέσιμα και έτσι μπορούμε να βοηθήσουμε για να διασφαλίσουμε τις προμήθειες τροφίμων και να μπορέσουμε να μειώσουμε τις τιμές των προϊόντων, των διατροφικών προϊόντων διεθνώς και έχει γίνει αυτό να διασφαλίσουμε την επιστημιστική ασφάλεια παγκοσμίω. Και ένα άλλο ερώτημα είναι να δούμε τι θα κάνουμε με την κοινή γεωργική πολιτική. Πράγματι, πολύ γνωρίζετε τι γίνεται. Ξέρουμε ότι ξεκινάει πράγματι από την 1η Ιανουαρίου ένα καινούριο πλάνο, στρατηγικά σχέδια, μια αναμόρφωση και θα προσπαθήσουμε να ενσωματώσουμε αυτή τη στρατηγική μέσα στην Πράσινη Συμφωνία. Μια ερώτηση που προέκυψε είναι το πώς θα καταφέρουμε να ενσωματώσουμε την στρατηγική από το αγρόκτημα στο πιάτο μέσα στην Πράσινη Συμφωνία. Και φυσικά να δούμε την κοινωνική βιωσιμότητα στο μεσοδιάστημα. Θα πρέπει να εξετάσουμε και το αποτέλεσμα. Η κοινή γεωργική πολιτική δουλεύει με διάφορα στρατηγικά σχέδια. Βάσει διαφορών αναλύσεων που έχουν γίνει από τα κράτη-μέλη, βάσει διάφορων α, αναλύσεων, ε, με βάση τα στοιχεία της Πράσινης Συμφωνίας, κατόπιν διαβούλευσης με τους αγρότες, τις ΜΚΟ, διάφορες αρχές περιβαλλοντικές και άλλες, και βάσει άλλων εργαλείων που έχουν σχεδιαστεί από τις αρχές. Όταν κατατεθούν αυτά τα σχέδια στο τέλος του χρόνου, η Επιτροπή θα τα μελετήσει, θα αποστείλει σχόλια στις προτάσεις, θα τα αποστείλει ίσως πίσω για διορθώσεις, για μετατροπές. Σίγουρα είναι κάτι που θα πάρει χρόνο. Και μέχρι τώρα, αν δεν κάνω λάδα, έχουν υιοθετηθεί 13 
τέτοια σχέδια. 15 αυτή τη στιγμή ετοιμάζονται και πιστεύουμε ότι σε μερικές μέρες θα έχουμε την έγκριση αρκετών. Η Ελλάδα δεν βρίσκεται αυτή τη στιγμή μέσα σε αυτές τις χώρες που, έχουν, που ετοιμάζουν κάποιο σχέδιο αναμόρφωσης κινησιολογικής πολιτικής. Όμως αυτή, αυτό θα είναι το πλαίσιο των ειδωτήσεων που θα δοθούν από την 1η Ιανουαρίου και έπειτα. Τι μας αποφέρουν τώρα αυτά τα σχέδια. Το βασικό που συζητάμε και σε αυτή τη συνεδρία είναι τα χρηματοδοτικά εργαλεία, η ανθεκτικότητα στον γεωργικό τομέα και είναι πολύ σημαντικό. Εγώ μιλάω για την πρόσφυνη συμφωνία, την περιβαλλοντική βιωσιμότητα και θα πρέπει να υπογραμμίσω ότι αυτά τα σχέδια θα μπορέσουν να βεβαιώσουν την, το εισόδημα, τον, το βασικό εισόδημα για την βιωσιμότητα. Ύστερα έχουμε διάφορα άλλα εισοδήματα, συμπληρωματικά εισοδήματα για διάφορους άλλους τομείς, για τους νέους αγρότες, παραδείγματος χάρη αναδιαμητικές στηρίξεις για μικρότερες φάρμες και ο τρόπος που το μοιράζουμε έχει αλλάξει. Ε, γιατί θέλουμε να υπάρχουν δεσμεύσεις για τη βιωσιμότητα. Υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένε ε, απαιτήσεις, αλλά θα πρέπει να υπογραμμίσουμε αυτή την ενίσχυση του εισοδήματος και φυσικά ο συντονιστής σήμερα μίλησε για τις δύσκολες στιγμές που ζούμε σχετικά με τα με το ρίσκο που υπάρχει, τους κινδύνους, τα επιτόκια. Και τώρα να δούμε πώς εμείς πράττουμε υπέρ της βιωσιμότητας. Τι σημαίνει όμως, γιατί το λέμε, αλλά τι θα θέλαμε να κάνουν οι αγρότες. Εδώ βλέπετε τους διάφορους τύπους οικολογικών σχημάτων που οδηγούν στη βιωσιμότητα. Τι συζητάμε. Σχετικά, συζητάμε σχετικά με την γεωργία ακριβίας, με την δέσμευση του εκδίδου του άνθρακα, με την προστασία του εδάφους. Εδώ, σε αυτά τα θέματα, αφορούν όλες οι αποφάσεις που έχουμε πάρει. Και τα επόμενα χρόνια θα τις δούμε ακριβώς. Βλέπετε και τις χώρες που έχουν αναλάβει ε, τις συζητήσεις για τα συγκεκριμένα θέματα. Γιατί αυτές ε, θα πρέπει να δημιουργήσουν πιο συγκεκριμένα μέτρα για να βοηθήσουν την βιωσιμότητα σε αυτά τα ζητήματα. Και κάτι άλλο που ανέφερε και ο συντονιστής έχει να κάνει με τη μείωση των εξόδων, των κόστους. Παραδείγματος χάρη, η διατήρηση του εδάφους μακροπρόθεσμα θα μπορέσει να βοηθήσει με την μακροπρόθεσμη γονιμότητα του εδάφους. Επομένως, αυτές οι επενδύσεις θα έχουν απόδοση μακροπρόθεσμα. Και τέλος, σχετικά με αυτά τα προγράμματα θα πρέπει να αναφέρουμε και την καινοτομία και αν δεν κάνω λάθο στην επόμενη παρουσίαση θα μιλήσουμε για την καινοτομία στην οποία η Ελλάδα σχεδιάζει να κάνει πολλά. Επενδύουμε σε ερευνητικά προγράμματα, σε πολύ περισσότερα σε σχέση με το παρελθόν. Υπάρχουν και κονδύλια τα οποία θα δοθούν από την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση για τέτοιου τύπου Έρευνες και σχέδια, σχετικά και με άλλα σχέδια θα δοθούν ε, κονδύλια ε, με την έρευνα και την καινοτομία, ε, με τον 
μπορέσουμε να εφαρμόσουμε την πρακτική καινοτομία στο σημείο. Και πιστεύουμε ότι θα γίνουν όλα αυτά τα επόμενα πέντε χρόνια. Είναι αυτό που θα μας βοηθήσει ε, να μειώσουμε τα έξοδα μακροπρόθεσμα για να έχουμε έναν ε, ε, γεωργικό τομέα που θα περιβάλλεται από ευημερία. Θα πρέπει να σκεφτούμε ότι ε, Εκτός από την κρίση και εκτός από τα προβλήματα, στην καρδιά του γεωργικού τομέα είναι τα τρόφιμα, είναι η ποιότητα και είναι αυτό που ενδιαφέρει την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Είναι αυτό που θα καθοδηγήσει τις υπόλοιπες συζητήσεις μας. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ, κύριε Σιλτχόης. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ γιατί τηρήσατε και το χρόνο σας. Κερδίσατε το ρολόι. Κάνατε και 35 θερόλεπτα πιο σύντομα. Και έτσι θα έχουμε λοιπόν τη δυνατότητα να συζητήσουμε λίγο και όλα αυτά που αναφέρατε. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που θέσατε υπόψη μας το ότι η μεταρρύθμιση της αγροτικής πολιτικής, κοινής γεωργικής πολιτικής ολοκληρώθηκε τη στιγμή που ξεκινούσε η κρίση στην Ευρώπη. Και αυτό που αναρωτιέμαι είναι το πώς η Επιτροπή και τα κράτη-μέλη κατάφεραν να συντονίσουν αυτές τις περιστάσεις. Μας είπατε επίσης ότι η σταθερότητα και στη συνέχεια η ανθεκτικότητα είναι βασικά σημεία των προσπαθειών που θα καταβάλουμε για να μπορούμε να παρακολουθήσουμε την εξέλιξη της κοινή γεωργικής πολιτικής. Και σίγουρα θα ήθελα να μας εξηγήσετε το πώς γίνεται η προτεραιοποίηση όσον αφορά τη βιωσιμότητα, τη σταθερότητα και την ανθεκτικότητα, ωστόσο αυτά θα γίνουν μετά. Because now, I, because now I would like to give the floor to the Deputy Minister Stilios. A few years ago, he started with digital governance, and today he holds an office of the Ministry of Rural Development and Food. So you realize that his topic of expertise is in great harmony with the previous question regarding whether we have built it in a, on a hierarchical mode. Mr. Stilius, you have the floor. You see the timer over there. That's all the time you have. Feel free to go to the podium in order to address the audience. So, hello everyone. I'm going to speak in Greek, but if you would like me to speak in English, I can answer the questions in English. It is with great pleasure that I find myself here in the agribusiness forum again. It's the second consecutive year to take part in this conference in my capacity as Deputy Minister of Rural Development and Food. Like I said, Mr. Papavigenidis, I'm quite seasoned in the fields of those programs and their implementation. I'm well aware of the agribusiness contribution. I'm well aware that it is widely acknowledged and accepted by leaders in this sector and by lame participants in this process. You do realize that this issue brings forward other things, things that are timely, that uh, constitute a major point of concern in terms of designing the future and seeing which are the next steps to be taken. Today we're here to address food security and sufficiency in times of uncertainty. 
This is one of the major topics of our times. Quite recently, 10 days ago, I attended the OECD Rural Farming Ministers meeting in Paris, and we discussed the topics of sustainability and resilience of our production systems. This is something that affects us all. It also affects ourselves, all the member states of the European Union, as well as the countries that are not members of the European Union. When it comes also to another meeting at Luxembourg, we also discuss the resilience of our production systems. And another topic of concern is, of course, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine, as well as the restructuring or rather the readjustment and reprioritization of issues that uh, are considered as a priority by ourselves. To make the long story short, the topic discussed here today is a topic that is in the limelight and has come in the limelight in a fierce way due to the war. All the countries need to review the sufficiency, self-sufficiency and the unobstructed operation of the supply chain. And I would like to also elaborate on a few things. We, at the Ministry of Rural Development and Food, say that our country is independent food-wise in order to meet the dietary and food needs of our population. Like we say, our market operates at a good pace. Of course, there's no need here to bore you with a further elaborate analysis of how I did that and how I'm so confident about what I say. However, the topic discussed here today is a topic that will be a major point of concern in the upcoming years for another additional reason. The food demands and needs all around the world are on the rise. So when the population will, all around the globe will be more than 10 trillion, you do realize that the key question to be answered is whether we're able to meet their needs in terms of food. We want our population to feed and to thrive. Financing tools and instruments falls within the same category of discussion. We have focused on two different programs at the Ministry. The first is quite new, fresh out of the oven. Oh, it was uh, late October that the financing agreement was signed between our Ministry and uh, the Development Bank and the Ministry of Development. I'm talking about the Small Loans Fund which is also known as the microcredit fund. It is a flexible liquidity tool that provides financing to producers and they receive money sums from 3,000 up to 25,000 euro. Our ministry provides the guarantees for the disbursement of this loan. This means that farmers don't need to provide assets guarantee. You do realize that we have the Rural Development Plan, which um, uh, is financed uh, with 25 million euro, and uh, we provide a grace period uh, without any interest, and for the rest uh, of the years of the loan, we fund uh, 50% of the interest rates. Again, I say that this is a tool mainly addressed or aimed to boosting liquidity of the producers. But of course, 
all should realize that this is not a consumption purpose loan. It is a production-oriented loan. And we expect them to provide the farmers with the right tools in order for them to move on to the next phase to raise awareness among the broader public. That's what we do towards this direction. And it is on this occasion that I'm announcing it, this that thing today. We want people to know where they can seek for support in order to meet their liquidity needs. We also have the Guarantee Fund. That's the second program we, which is uh, ongoing. This is funded with 80 million euro, and we believe that through leveraging on the funds, uh, we can provide loans that might be up to 400 to 450 million euro as a total. And when it comes to the Guarantees Fund, loans can start from 10,000 euro up to 3 million euro producers are split down in categories depending on their production capacity their turnover and of course the, the separate needs this is a program that is underway since 2020 until today we have granted loans equaling 40 million euro Maybe due to the pandemic, we didn't see a massive utilization of these tools on behalf of the farmers, but we hope that since we're on our way out of the crisis and through better awareness raising and promotion activities, farmers will opt for these financing solutions so that we can better achieve the goal set in the strategic planning. Well, my goal and our goal at the ministry has been to help our producers. We want them to overcome the weaknesses of the past. I'm talking about weaknesses in the agricultural sector, of course, I'm talking about red tape. With the broader red tape related issues that are inherent to the public sector, Minister of Rural Development and Food is no exception in that. So since day one, we have been seeking to simplify those processes. Another example that is a living proof of that commitment of us is the Young Farmers, Young Producers program. I'm going to elaborate on the digital interventions undertaken in the context of that. We have abolished the submission of physical hard copy dossier. All justifying documents and applications are collected at the vast majority, 9 out of 10, through the interoperability of the systems, meaning that investors, producers need to go just once at the office of the person who is responsible to complete the process on their behalf. Our goal has been for the producers to know whether the tender will be announced and when the assessment will be completed. We tried to reduce the time interval by 50%, so over six, seven months, we were able to enjoy the results and have the actual results of the program. Compared to the past, we know that we have managed to achieve this reduction in the past 10 up to 12 months would be required before we see the results of that. The evaluation was also carried out digitally. And now we have already announced all the programs and tenders run by our ministry. And all future tenders will follow the same process. Everything will happen online. 
We also corrected at least one out of ten just fine documents that had to be submitted a hard copy, and recently the relevant announcement has been made in collaboration with the Ministry of Finances and the Independent Authority for, uh, for the State Income, so that now the applicants no longer need to go there in person to submit their dossier. They will be informed when the tender is announced and opens. They will know what the deadline will be. There will be consecutive cycles that are clearly determined from day one. They will be short. Each of them will be short. And in that way, we hope that we will enable producers to benefit from our programs. Next month, December, we will announce uh, the Improvement or Reclamation Works project with a budget of 230 million euro. It is addressed to those who produce things, for example, someone would like to buy livestock, capital, or if they want to improve their production, they're eligible for that program. The same applies to those who would like to upgrade their machinery, to buy new pieces of equipment, or other applications that provide flexibility to farms. I'm talking about drones. Of course, the same applies to other useful applications. Let me now highlight two very useful applications recently at the Saloniki in the context of the exhibition for Beyond Innovation. We had a researcher who presented a tool according to which the livestock breeder will be able to provide information about the production, the needs of the feed rations, and their financial results, and whether this needs to be improved, and this is calculated by the application automatically, and whether they need to focus on in order to improve the results. That's a major asset for our producers. For the time being, this has not been uh, an option for them. So they had to do everything manually to sum up things, deduct all the other expenses, etc., see well, what's uh, the proportion of other indirect expenses that should be also considered and calculated in the price and the result. So now the result is better for the farmers. The same applies for themselves and their families. And uh, another thing, an announcement made by our Prime Minister during the International Thessaloniki Exhibition, in order to meet uh, the needs uh, of energy, there is also a possibility for 75,000 farmers, professional farmers, to receive licenses to connect to the agreed and they can enjoy 10 kilowatt per license and every producer can have two or three different licenses, meaning a sum of 20 to 30 kilowatts for their own purposes in order to be used on their own premises and then the remaining of the power can be given to the VA grid so they will consume what they need and the remaining will be resent, returned to the VA. And we came to realize that some grids uh, were overloaded. Now, when it comes to the improvement work, so we found a 55% for the buyout of renewable energy sources and the installation of those systems. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your speech, Mr. Stilios. You were right on time. Well, now you presented everything that is out live and running, but we specialized uh, uh, for the digital sector and generally the use of digital services that will help us in the future. Even for the last two elements you mentioned, the tool for excellence, and there is, of course, a post-grad um, 
a postdoc student that uh, presents such an innovation and innovative platform is something that could perhaps be used. And uh, the other thing is the licenses that you use to that you give to the farmers and the grid will be able, if you say so, to uh, carry all this energy. Well, the sooner the better. Maybe I wasn't very clear previously. So it's, it, has, it is technical, uh, the clarification. These 75,000 licenses to connect are beyond the already existing grid. So our uh, connecting energy body can connect those extra licenses and this can be an immediate measure and it can help, I think, a lot of our farmers. I know that we cannot, of course, give this opportunity to all farmers because we have 350,000 uh, farmers and uh, 1,775 will use this measure. Now, let me ask Mr. Evangelos Litras, who is a chief executive officer for the GRP Ventures. I asked him how this is possible, and we discussed earlier about this matter. He is a venture capitalist in the agri-food sector. So as an investor, he does both things that interest us today. So he does an assessment. He tries to assess the risk of an investment. And he also wants to secure the financing that will make this uh, investment possible. So I look forward to see uh, how this is going to work, because in the past, when we talked about financing, we talked about the banks, we talked about this nation, European Union, etc. So how can this work? You have the word. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be in this very interesting meeting. And uh, you said very correctly so that the venture capitalist sense is not so widely known. But before I move to my presentation, and before I share with you what we do and what are the things we look forward before we invest into a business, I'd like to say very um, specific things. We are specific uh, organizations, schemes of uh, venture capitals, and we invest in businesses to the whole spectrum, from the farm to the businesses, from the field to the businesses. So we talk about uh, capital investment, and uh, we could call this equity, and we can have a majority or minority uh, contribution to the business. This could also last uh, for certain years, five, six years, and then we uh, move out from this business. We have already agreed that uh, when we leave, the, our shares will be bought out from other shareholders, new shareholders, or already existing shareholders. So we enter a business at a certain point of uh, development and we try to use all of our tools uh, to help them develop further. Now, I'd like to share with you the criteria for choosing such a business. First of all, it has to do with the team. Every business needs a very powerful team. We are interested in their relation. We are interested in 
the people that uh, work in this business, that are the leaders. Um, we want to know if this is a business that changes stuff all the time. We want to know if, of course, there is passion and determination apart from a good chemistry. We want to learn about the vision of the businessman that, of course, should be written down in a business plan. And we want to see this passion and the vision to, uh, of course, uh, move forward with this uh, vision and plan. Well, all of these are great, but numbers always speak the truth. Business should also prove that there is, of course, a very good and right um, operation to their business side. And of course, everyone understands in this business the numbers and we can see uh, if their decisions are justified by the numbers or not. And of course, uh, it is of course understandable that all social security payments for the employers should be as well paid and other uh, responsibilities or expenses. Then we move to the products of the business. Does the business perhaps have a certain products with no uh, product value or that are not popular or sold? There are a lot of businesses in our market with a lot of barcodes, uh, different products that uh, do not bring any return. That's very important. I believe that small and medium enterprises have a long way to go. As a venture capital, we want, apart from financing, to provide the business with aid so that they can be present in our times and we can, of course, uh, make our minds and take uh, the decisions that need to be made to help the business develop further. The sector of marketing and products is something we, of course, pay close attention to. Uh, in the agri-food sector, we, uh, of course, have the products of a certain origin and they create a said brand. I really don't know um, how um, often the managers of these brands uh, are making uh, payments. Um, there is, this is a part that needs a lot of work. In other businesses, the marketing sector is very important, irrespective of which business, uh, there should be a brand name, a well-known product that could be, of course, uh, uh, marketed further. What does brand mean? Let me give you an example. The uh, car manufacturer Volvo, uh, what do you think when you hear it? You think of security, safety. And that's, of course, a huge, uh, uh, of huge importance for the brand. That goes on further, and that's what they look forward to, and small, medium enterprises should learn from these steps. Now, about new businesses, about startups, for us, 
us, we want to see the first uh, indicators that the startup is being accepted in the market. We had an example in the past, uh, someone who tested out um, their products, a uh, yogurt, and he sent uh, a batch in a supermarket, and he wanted to see how they will perform. He received a call from the supermarket owner because he wanted more yogurts to sell uh, because they were uh, very good. So that's what we want to see. We want those things to be tested. Now, let's talk about trust, about the fame one has, and about the customer one has. Uh, we really want to uh, hear more about an entrepreneur from investment men, bankers, and from others, and we are the ones, of course, who are going to ask uh, our um, colleagues and other uh, partners for possible uh, future uh, partners. Another thing we talk about a lot is the pitch deck. It is on trend right now. I would like to underline the following, that we would like, it would be good if we had for uh, small, medium enterprises to have uh, advisors to create such a pitch deck, such a presentation, but they shouldn't, of course, pass on this responsibility to the advisor. The businessman should have a very clear vision, very clear um, plan, and he, she can help the advisor to create this into a chart, a plan, etc. We see many times uh, presentations and pitch decks that, uh, of course, do not um, translate the vision uh, for the business. Let's talk about challenges and risks. There is, of course, no business uh, without risk. That's a reality. We want to see if the business has understood what's the major risk it faces. So if you are a car manufacturer, you have, uh, of course, risks for not finding raw products. The same goes for a farmer. Um, if the prices go up, this goes for all professions. And of course, people are part of businesses, and we talk about uh, these three Ds, death, divorce, and disability. So if you have someone in your business who is unique, who does everything, if this person tomorrow is not well, is not there, then there should be uh, of course, an answer how the business will go on. So the business should have, of course, understood the risks there are and to have solutions for them. Now, what's the expected valuation of the company? So, we wouldn't like to hear somebody saying to us, I have a 500,000 uh, euros business and I want to move it to 1,000 euros, to 1 million euros. So, 
We can't either hear that we have a 2 million euro company, we want to move it to a 500 million company. We want to hear something realistic. Also, um, on the evaluation aspect, we understand that, of course, the creation of a business takes a lot of time and effort, and they need to evaluate it correctly. The market has always different solution and a different answer. Let's talk about technology. Technology should be found in the DNA of the company, um, whether that is embedded in their DNA or not. We've heard a lot of times that we don't have enough uh, um, people to work on this sector. Well, technology is the answer that will help us, um, of course, solve this problem. Now, about intellectual property. We are doing very well, whether these are registered or not. We have a lot of patents, and we are interested that, uh, of course, these are uh, registered, and uh, the company owns the rights. Then we talk about the ESG criteria, and a lot of businesses were afraid of them. They thought that they create an extra cost. But I believe that uh, the company, every company should, uh, of course, have in mind this ESG criteria. Um, someone might ask, okay, I'm a small business, what does EG, ESG has to do with me? But uh, from uh, 2024, um, there will be changes, because even as a supplier, even as a small uh, farmer, you should be able to fulfill all ESG criteria. This is what venture capitalists look for, and uh, I would like to say that before reaching out to a venture capitalist for financing, you should uh, have all answers to the things we mentioned today. Thank you very much. Ms. Elytras, I'm glad that you made a presentation that is relevant to the agri-food sector because I believe that this has paved the way for the following. You practically tell us that the agri-food sector or other aspects that the agri-food sector is not that much different from other sector. This means that now people are able to know whether they're able to inject some capital in their business or seek capital, both to promote their businesses or sell their business in a profitable way or upgrade their businesses before selling it or anything else. And you help us realize that we need to keep our eye in the intermediate stages and phases. I'm, I have my own reservations, but regarding the ESG, you said mentioned, but anyway, we will discuss that. It is important to fill this gap between the agri food sector and all the other sectors of the economy. This presentation has been a mundane presentation for the American back in the 50s. So it is a, a good thing that this is delivered in Greece of 2013. Okay, the Netherlands, it's another case entirely. Now, we had uh, the main presentations. I'm not, well, they have been interesting, but there's no point in highlighting that. Let's now move on to the Q&A section. I would like to ask Mr. Stilius and Ms. Yemelou 
to ask a question about the main pillars of the economy. My question is, how does this quadruple crisis, Greek economy, Greek business, Greek agri-food business, Greek farmers, they have all had to adopt to the three memoranda. They had to go through the COVID pandemic and all its repercussion. Now they're currently going through the energy crisis and uh, the transition as well as the skyrocketing of the prices. So the question is, can all those uh, sectors and aspects withstand that thing? Now, Mr. Stelios. Okay, ladies went first in the first round. You have the floor first here. Well, I believe that the answer has already been provided in my statement because I talked about the guarantees fund and I said that right now we have disbursed loans up to 40 million euro and we would have been able to give out loans equal to 450 million euro. And my explanation for that was exactly the pandemic, but I also have another explanation that I would like to combine with the way in which the market operated in the year 2022 amidst the war. Because we knew that something would, was coming up with the increase of the energy prices and then the war came up. So what I have seen is that all stakeholders in the production process had the capital in order to buy what they needed in order to ensure the production for the upcoming year. So, we have a percentage of people, I cannot say whether it's big or small, I believe that this has to do with the vast majority of our producers, both in terms of farming and livestock breeding. So, those people went through the four crises we described before, the memorandum and so on and so forth, and now they had to deal with another crisis that emerged in the year 2022 with money that they had in cash. I don't know whether the banks can give us relevant data and whether they drew financing from there, but what we realize at the ministry and the base of the statistics is that this was a effective at the vast majority of cases. What was their top priority? To buy the feed for their flocks, to buy fertilizers for the upcoming year, to ensure that they have some capital set aside in order to ensure that their production will be sustainable for the next year. That's one explanation I can give. I believe it's rather valid. I would also like to share a couple more things. We have some data about the balance for the year 2020 and the year 2021 for the agri-food sector. And we had a surplus. After decades, it had a surplus. And when I talk about decades, that's literally an explanation about that. Well, 530 million euro in 2020 and 450 million euro in 2021. The explanation is that the primary sector has gone for the accounting process. They follow the models presented before. And you do realize that this is the outcome part well. They have written everything down. They have calculated everything to the last cent. The markets they would opt for the investments they would make. So our producers had to operate in an entrepreneurial way. So you do realize that at the ministry our goal is to support them, not just to help them make ends meet or replenish their income. 
What we want is to create rural entrepreneurs, agri-food business entrepreneurs who will be able to withstand adversities. Ms. Yemelou, you listened to that comment. Mr. Stilius, the minister is here and he described the concept of rural professionals or rural entrepreneurs. My question is, is there demand for your products? You described all the products you have. How do you develop this demand in practice? You represent the banking sector. So there is only one thing that you're afraid of, NPLs, non-performing loans. So, we know that we have a bitter, there's a bitter history in that. I try to put it very nicely, but my question is, is there an increase in terms of the interest expressed on behalf of the farmers, and are you eager to respond to that? Well, thank you very much for this question. I believe that banks, and today I'm here to represent the National Bank of Greece, I have a story to share. Actually, I have the experience to be able to talk on behalf of other banks as well. Further to what Mr. Stilia said before, we support businesses through all the programs I described before. We know, or rather they know, that the banks will give them what they need. And once farmers have the support they need through those things, we come back to our offices and wonder, okay, what do the farmers don't have? income. So we try to invest at a percentage of 20%, so we want the ministry to support them by at a percentage of 80%, and we will support them at a percentage of 20%. Another vision of us is to collaborate with big companies. Mr. Stelia said before, that they had cash in order to buy the fertilizers, their feeds, etc. Farmers will never sell the land, will never let others to buy other land, and will never let others buy other machines, because if this happens, this means that they're done. Like I say, they will not even sell the pettiest of their premises and infrastructure. So, what did we do in that case? We tried to approach them through big traders and we said that, okay, big businessmen who would like to invest in farmers or who are investing in farmers will provide guarantees. They will give a 50% guarantee, will also provide another 50% of guarantees so that the investment of the farmer will be sustainable, they will be able to work in the year to come. We will be able to see what will happen and whether we will be able to absorb a part of that. The increase in the interest rate or an installment that uh, is not uh, paid or anything else. Yes, contract farming is uh, our major card here because we cannot have farmers saying, okay, that's my income. We cannot rely on that because we're afraid and we're right about that. We cannot go back down that road again. Through contract farming, we can support them throughout the way. We have many programs, many tools at our disposal, so we do provide practical support. We, as a ministry, want to ensure that producers improve. We cannot have the transfer of agricultural products all around Europe, having 6 or 70 percent of them being transferred and uh, traded through collectivities, and the respective percentage in Greece to be up to 20 percent. And we know that contract farming is not so much popular here. And this is why we made a central political decision with a view to educating and training our producers. So we say that in many of our programs, our priority is to have the farmers being professionals, full-time professionals, and members of contract farming agreements. That's a uh, general policy. We opted for tax reductions. Recently, we have another example where we reduced by 50% the taxable income for producer group members 
and uh, the contract farming producers. I'm talking about the taxable income of 30,000 euro. Prior to our legislative intervention, which now has been translated uh, to a law in the city, before that they ha would have to pay a tax of 5,400 euro, and now they will have to pay 1,700 euro. You do realize that that's a massive incentive. I know that it's not easy to set up groups of producers. We have specific credits given when we examine and consider their eligibility, but there is an extensive tax incentive in collaboration with the banks. That's exactly what I said before, because that was a major incentive for us and our customers as well. Και τώρα, λοιπόν, στον κύριο Σελτχουής, μια ερώτηση. Ελπίζω και πάλι να μην πρόφερε λάθος το όνομά σας. Θα ήθελα τώρα να μας πείτε, αν, πέρα από το κομμάτι της ανθεκτικότητας, σταθερότητας, βιωσιμότητας, μας είπατε, όλη αυτή η μετατροπή του βραχυπρόθεσμου στο μακροπρόθεσμο, γιατί τελικά... Η μεταρρύθμιση που ευαγγελίζεται, η κοινή γεωργική πολιτική, είναι μια μακροπρόθεσμη διαδικασία. Πώς αυτό έχει επηρεαστεί από τις αλλεπάλληλες κρίσεις και ειδικά τις ενεργειακές κρίσεις και την ενεργειακή κρίση που βιώνουμε αυτή τη στιγμή. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Νομίζω ότι είναι μια πολύ καλή ερώτηση. Μία απάντηση είναι ότι χρειάστηκε πολύ χρόνος και πάρα πολύ πολιτική έχουν επηρεάσει τη διαμόρφωση της μεταρρύθμισης της κοινή γεωργικής πολιτικής. Το θέμα είναι να υπάρχει μια συνέχεια στις προτάσεις που υποβάλλονται προς συζήτηση. Από το 2018 εστιάζουμε πάρα πολύ στις πτυχές της βιωσιμότητας. Είναι κάτι που υποστηρίχθηκε θερμά από τα κράτη-μέλη. Φυσικά έγιναν συζητήσει αναφορικά με το ποσοστό και τις ποσοστώσεις, αλλά... Το θέμα είναι ότι η κοινή γεωργική πολιτική ήταν από την αρχή ευθυγραμμισμένη με τις προτάσεις της Πράσινης Συμφωνίας που τέθηκαν επί τάπητος. Αυτή τη στιγμή, όπως είπατε, έχουμε να αντιμετωπίσουμε την ενεργειακή κρίση. Καταλαβαίνουμε ότι οι μακροπρόθεσμες λύσεις περιλαμβάνονται σε αυτή την πρόταση. Έχει να κάνει με τη μείωση της εξάρτησης, έχει να κάνει με τη βελτίωση της αποτελεσματικότητας και των αποδοτικών επιλογών. Άρα λοιπόν όλα αυτά τα πράγματα υπάρχουν. Και τι κάναμε. Ουσιαστικά την άνοιξη όταν ξέσπασε ο πόλεμος δουλεύαμε τα, τις επιστολές, παρα, τις παρατηρήσεις που στείλαμε στα κράτη-μέλη και τους είπαμε για επανεξετάστε λίγο αυτό το κομμάτι για την θεκτικότητα, για παράδειγμα για τα βιοαέρια. Κάνετε πολλά πράγματα, κάνετε ό,τι μπορείτε ή κάνετε ό,τι μπορείτε στο κομμάτι της επισητιστικής ασφάλειας. Ζητήσαμε λοιπόν από τα κράτη μέλη να επανεξετάσουν το τι κάνουν. Έγιναν κάποιες αλλαγές, όχι τεράστιες, αλλά παρατηρήσαμε κάποιες αλλαγές και σε αυτό το κομμάτι. Οπότε υπήρξαν κάποιες περιστάσεις όπου προσπαθήσαμε να προσαρμόσουμε αυτά τα σχέδια στην τρέχουσα πραγματικότητα και τα σχέδια μπορούν να τροποποιηθούν. Δεν θέλουμε τα σχέδια βέβαια να τροποποιούνται κάθε τρεις και λίγο. Θέλουμε να υπάρχει σταθερότητα και στις πολιτικές. Ωστόσο, κάθε χρόνο υπάρχει δυνατότητα στα κράτη-μέλη να δουν τι πρέπει να αλλάξει, τι πρέπει να τροποποιηθεί και να διασφαλίσουμε φυσικά ότι τα σχέδια εξυπηρετούν τους μακροπρόθεσμους στόχους που έχουμε θέσει. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. And now, Mr. Litres, a question, a poisonous question for you. So, the thing you just presented to us, do you believe that you, you could have presented those things five years earlier? And what will one think if you present those things after five years from now? So, how is the agri-food sector Uh, attached to these. Well, thank you for this question. It is very interesting. Because previously I was uh, working for uh, the, the banking sector. The new generation 
has the will, it needs help, but loves what it does and they want to be successful. So I'm very positive that very quickly uh, all these uh, steps that are now are at the walking pace will very quickly become uh, at a running pace. And a lot of people have seen with different mindset the profession of a farmer, of a stock breeder, and uh, they have a different mindset compared to the past. We see that there is a lot of movement and Greece has a lot of uh, things to give back and I believe that everywhere that uh, our products have been and have been sold and presented, they are welcome and we have a competitive advantage. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank everybody here in this panel and I'm very happy for for this um, uh, ambitious period uh, that exists. I would like to thank also everybody uh, that are present or that uh, watched our streaming online. And I would ask, uh, ask now Mr. Yanis uh, Marakakis to talk to us about the next day, tomorrow. Here at Donis, I'd like to thank you as well, and of course all speakers of this panel and all participants of our uh, first day of meeting. Today we had four sessions uh, that covered four different uh, subjects. Tomorrow we have another four. Um, we were eight hours live, and I believe uh, that we were also very good with the time management. We were uh, we started a bit late, but we ended uh, right on time. I hope we manage to do that tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we'll start at 9:30 with the live streaming, and for everybody that that are watching us and uh, I would like to thank them for their attention and for their participation. I want to remind once more that they have the ability to ask questions through the platform and these questions reach our coordinators and they then pose those questions to the speakers. And we can also see the online booths. And I'd like now to mention that uh, this event was able because of the support and, of course, the joyful participation of the National Bank of Greece, the Corteva, the GRP Ventures, the Mr. Kostadakopoulos, the interpreted who with Faye, Valia and Maria are all day long doing the interpretation, the simultaneous interpretation for us. I would like to thank as well Nectar with their beverages. I would like to thank the Athenian brewery and of course all the products that we can of course, uh, have taste and will taste later. And let me thank as well the help of uh, all the girls here today from the EAC 360. And uh, let me thank uh, Marina Mandru, Yana Kodotoli, and Marina Panagiotis. I would like to thank you all for your time and your presence. Thank you for your participation and your support. See you tomorrow morning at 9.30 sharp. Thank you.